All right. Welcome to episode 10 of the Movement is Medicine podcast. I'm Kevin Carr coming to you by way of Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, talking to Brendan, who is 11 hours behind me in uh, Northern California in the Bay Area. So uh, how are you doing, Brendan? I'm doing well. Happy Easter. If, if you yeah. Oh, yeah. celebrate that type of thing. Happy, I know. happy Easter, happy Passover, happy Ramadan, all uh, lining up here. So whatever you might celebrate. Yeah. Um, hopefully my voice isn't too harsh. Uh, I literally today when I was coaching, uh, CFSC, like I literally could like almost not speak uh, for a part piece of a moment of time. I had to have Sylvia like take over a chunk of the course because we're, we're teaching this gym's unbelievable here in the UAE. It, it just champs sports. It's like, it's actually what I would love to have like MBSC in the future. It's like a, a great strength conditioning facility plus a regular gym. I don't really need the regular gym part in the regular workout <laughs> part. But then there's uh, there's multiple basketball courts, multiple soccer fields. Uh, there's oh, an MMA area. Like, and so, but you should see. I mean, this place. Uh, they these things are rented out. These fields and courts are rented out all day, every day. Kids, just soccer teams, basketball teams, practices, um, nonstop. So one, they're probably making a good chunk of change. But it's just cool yeah. they have a ton of space. Like this place has got to be. Uh, almost 100,000 square feet. It's huge. Damn. Um, but Do they have the that, nature stuff, like the the trees and the jungle no, sounds, a, or no, is that Matt, the last Matt place? Matt Coe, the first, first to play, time I ever came here, Matt Coe, if he's listening, uh, is a personal trainer, training conditioning coach here, and he took me to his gym, and he had like literally like whole nature place so people could like do like earthing, like with like rocks and plants. That was pretty cool. You know, that was at yeah. the top of like a skyscraper. But this place is like a typical <laughs> industrial area. Um, but oh, right. I had to be loud because like the gym is still open the whole time. So there's people working yep. out and there's music. And then there's all these crazy kids playing sports and running around. So like I'm trying to coach. And I was like literally screaming. And I mean, I'm sure it didn't also have to do with the fact that I was out with a bunch of the guys from the course <laughs> last night until God knows what no. hour. Um, yeah. But no, that couldn't, uh, that like couldn't have contributed coaching. to the problem at all. <laughs> but I'm re I'm having I just had some tea. Uh, I uh -huh. had some water, so hopefully by the time I teach in Amsterdam this coming weekend, or Breda, I should say, Netherlands Breda, uh, my voice will be back. So you know, you won't you won't stay out late there have... either. So it's just me. I'm less liable to get into trouble by myself. Yeah, that's uh, true. With, yeah, I was with a group a... of I was with four, I was with like three Serbian guys last night. And something about these Serbian guys when we go out, uh, they're just, they don't stop. Um, so, you know, hopefully <laughs> no I'll have a restful switch. few days. No, no, the Europeans. Um, but no, it's been good. It's also, uh, it's Ramadan, like I said here. Um, and so I'm probably the only person that's not fasting all day long. Uh, I'm just chowing down all day while everybody else uh, isn't eating from sun, sun up to sunset. I'm the um. fat American that's here. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, no, you're, you're easy to spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I definitely. The only guy, at, the only at, guy at the taco stand at noon. Yeah, well, it's actually very interesting. So I, I came here in Ramadan a few years ago, pre-COVID. Um, and it used to be very strict. So most restaurants were closed all day. Oh. Um, so, like, even if you didn't practice, like, eh, you might not be able to find yeah. some food. I hope you went grocery shopping. Um, and... Or if they were, if the restaurants and the hotels were open, they had shades covering all the windows or like blocking the doors because they don't want you seeing people seeing you eat. In fact, you couldn't even in public, like you could get fined for eating or drinking outside or even chewing gum because like you're, wow. they, they don't, it's like rude to be like eating in front of a bunch of people. But it's very Who interesting it came this time and none of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> what's very interesting though is um now because of covid all those restrictions are gone um so they were uh, saying like last year during ramadan they started it that way and people were like nah 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 like we've been stuck inside the house doing nothing for like the last year um yeah. and so obviously there's a lot of westerners and expats that live in the uae it's uh, probably the more progressive uh place over here um it they they've completely done away with that so i mean it's it's you wouldn't <laughs> know uh, really interesting. That anything was any different. So just an interesting change when you look at how COVID kind of impacted, you know, how they're getting yeah, lots of things in so lots of different what's ways. What's new with you while I've been traveling? Uh, we went 
to Big Bear Lake, which is about an hour outside of L.A. last weekend. We did the whole mm -hmm. shipping container cabin thing, which was awesome. Uh, the only problem was trying to fit a seven-year-old, two adults, and a 70-pound golden retriever uh, all in the same queen-size <laughs> feather bed was miserable. But everything else was amazing. Uh, we were at 6,000 feet. So the first day I had a pretty good headache and I drank one beer and was feeling a little woozy because the air so thin. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the second day, yep. I, we were all right. But we went hiking every day. We went and had lunch at a couple breweries. Um, we just <clears throat> enjoyed the outdoors and there was really no cell service other than a That's couple of nice. So yeah, we were there. We would have liked to stay there a couple more days we were only there for three um so next time we're gonna go again but next time but it'll be for a week we're not gonna drive all the way down there for three days again that was a little too short of a trip but it was how, how far well away is it, it so say? uh from my from our house it's five and a half hours that's oh, a hard <laughs> yeah yeah well the hard part is when you get about an hour out it's just all windy roads up that six thousand square feet so that that took the longest plus you wouldn't want to try to drive there in the winter time because we don't have the right you might not get there <laughs> you might not get there so we'll we're going to go again probably this summer nice Nice. Well, um, as you can tell by our uh, catching up, if you're listening, the reason we haven't really put out a podcast in the last couple of weeks is because we've been all over the place. Brendan has uh, was living in his uh, minimalist uh, shipping container <laughs> with his family, yep. and uh, I have been <laughs> traveling. Family. I'm currently, yeah, I'm currently in Dubai, and I'm going to uh, Netherlands uh, tonight. Actually, tomorrow I'm leaving at 1 a.m. So I'm going to pack up after nice. this and head to the airport. Oh, we're going to do and another one in the Netherlands. So we'll get a couple in here yeah, over the next few. We weeks. have a bunch of podcasts lined up, so we'll, we'll we will make up for the lack of production that we have had over the last few weeks. But um, bear with us as we we have been busy. Yeah. So, but we have some good questions, and there's been a lot of good topics in the news that and current events that we want to discuss. Um, and not Elon Musk and uh, Twitter, but uh, actual strength and conditioning based <laughs> topics. Um, so that we got a good question about conditioning. This came from um, a gentleman uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I promised him we'd get to it. And uh, now I'm finally getting to it. So sorry, you had to wait. So um, what he asked was specifically about how we program conditioning at MBSC as in relation to VO2 and heart rate and then gave his suggestions about what they do. So I'll actually just read um, the question. I'll paraphrase it. So he said, um, I want to know, based on what I've learned from you, is there a better way to prescribe HIT-based conditioning sessions based on testing uh, the right things? He currently uses the 3015 intermittent field test, um, which we can discuss in a little bit. He says it's very easy to format and has good correlation with an athlete's max aerobic speed, sprinting speed, change of direction, um, and VO2. Um, and that it's been very successful for him, for him, especially in team sports. And why don't we use that? And why do we rely on things like heart rate monitoring or our max aerobic speed approach? And um, I told him instead of writing him a long message, I was just going to talk on the podcast because uh, we could have a little, probably longer, more nuanced discussion. And I thought it was a good question to clarify how we program conditioning and energy system development work, uh, specifically with our athletes, but we'll talk about adults too. Um, at my mm -hmm. strength and conditioning. And um, so to kind of dig into his question, you might ask like, what is the 3015 intermittent field test? And so it's sim it's very much, if you're familiar with a yo-yo test, um, it's very similar to a yo-yo test, just um, a little bit tweaked to get more change of direction, specifically for athletes in there. And so it was developed by Martin Bukit. Bukit, I don't know how to say his name, so I apologize if I screwed up your name. Um, but it indirectly, it's a great to, way to like measure VO2 and max stroke speed for running specifically. And so what it is, it's a progressive shuttle running test um, where they do 30-second work efforts followed by 15 seconds of passive rest and recovery. And each continual bout of 30 seconds, you increase the speed. So you're on a field. Um, you're going to run to a end line and then turn around and run back. And you're doing that for 30 seconds. 
you start at eight kilometers an hour and each bout you increase the speed by 0.5 or half a kilometer an hour um, until the individuals or the athletes can no longer get to the prescribed distance. So they can't complete that 30 second effort at, to the distance that you want. And so then what you would do was take the distance that they covered, the last one that they were successful at, um, like in divide it, the speed and the distance, and you can figure out essentially what their max aerobic speed was, what their uh, max effort that they could get in that time was. And you could prescribe intervals, running-based intervals, so that the mode would have to be the same based on that score that they had. Um, and so he was asking, why do we not use that? Because if you look at the research around something like the 3015 IFT, it's really good. It's high validity, high reliability, especially when you compare it to other tests or like laboratory-based testing. Um, so it's a really valuable tool, especially in team sports. And that really comes down to why we don't really utilize a test like that or a yo-yo test um, at MBSC. And as I was saying to a lot of coaches this weekend, even when I was teaching the courses, 99% of the decisions you're gonna make in training are not gonna be guided by what you think is physiologically optimal. I mean, it might be, but a lot of it's gonna be determined by logistics. What do you have the space to do? What do you have the equipment for? What do, how many athletes do you have? Uh, and what are you capable of actually doing well? Um, and so we don't use uh, 3015 because in a privatized setting where I have, sometimes we have upwards of like almost 200 athletes in the gym. We all have, I have over 100 athletes in the afternoon always, especially in the summer. I don't have the space to run it at all. Uh, we would, like as big as MBSC is, you can come walk around. I don't have a space to run a test down and back, especially with a group of 12 or 13 kids yeah. like I might have. And it so it really only makes sense for uh, teams that have access to a field or, I mean, a court. Exactly. Uh, is a and court even big enough? For. Yeah. 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 You could do it there probably. Okay, you and, could do it um, on a court. Okay. Yeah. And so if, if you have open space without interference, like I have other people doing personal training, I have other groups working out. I just, I wouldn't be able to run it in there. Um, and I have a bunch of mostly like 12, 13 year old kids, 14 year old kids, 15 year old kids, maybe some professionals in the summer and college kids in the summer, but, um, just the logistics of running would be very difficult. Um, and the data tracking is slightly more complicated. I have to, I mean, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'd have to do the math for every single person there. Um, it's just one more variable I would have to do over 13 people now in a team setting where maybe you have. 40 guys or girls at most in front of you, but that's it. You can dedicate time to, to doing that. And it makes a lot of sense. So I, I'm not in any way saying it's not a valuable uh, testing method. Um, but I all will of our decisions add are going to the, yeah. the sport as well is important. Like the, the, what you just described to me, the 3015 seems very much beneficial for soccer rugby <laughs> field hockey but might not be the best for javelin throwing right <laughs> you just got to yeah, do yeah, one yeah. rep a couple no. times so yeah it's a, it's a conditioning sport. test right for probably most field or court sports um, absolutely but that's also definitely where it's utilized Right, where it's utilized the most. So if we're adding more context to this, remember that it's a good conditioning test, right, for who, right, who, what sport, what individual, and then logistically, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a good conditioning test if you have access to the right amount of mm -hmm. equipment or the um, the space to do it. So Absolutely. And... I specifically change the direction. That's why it's such a valuable test, I think, and why it's popular is because change the direction field sport athletes, which we have a lot of those. Right. Um, however, right. we will get change of direction work in other areas uh, by running tempos. And we do do shuttle runs, but we have like two little lanes that they run in. <laughs> one, two people rest, the next two go. Right. And so it's a compressed area. It'd be very tough. I couldn't right. run a test because on average, if you look at the a lot, how long that 3015 test takes if you were going to run it with a bunch of people it's like 20 something minutes right and so right it's a in within a 90 minute commercial friendly model like we run that's a significant chunk of time um to do testing and so again not to say it's not valuable it's just a matter of uh, time and space 
So the question is, Kevin, yes. what conditioning tests do you do? Well, okay, and so what, this is data, a good what data what data do you collect? Yeah, so this is good. So his part of his question, I think he had asked, you know, like do you do you prescribe the intensity for them based off heart rate? Because we know that heart rate doesn't necessarily have a correlation with like VO2 or max aerobic speed. And we know that. Like if you ride a uh, max aerobic speed test, your heart rate could be very variable based on the individual and it might not max. And you can't really use that as a reliable data point, at least for prescribing intensity. But we've posted a lot about how we use heart rate monitoring. But I think the misconception was li lied in the fact that we don't really use heart rate monitoring at all for prescribing intensity. We use it for prescribing recovery. Um, in measuring physiological measures of health more so than for prescribing intensity for performance, right? And so I'm not going to tell someone to do a bike sprint and be like, hey, I want you at this heart rate. Um, like, you know how they used to have those things on the treadmill at the gym. It's like, this is the heart rate zone you want to be in. Like, we don't prescribe it that way at all. We use the heart rate monitor to measure resting heart rate. So for uh, general population, um, we know that resting heart rate is directly correlated with all-cause mortality, risk of cardiovascular events, cardiovascular related death. So really important marker for all of our people to come to see us. Where's their resting heart rate? We want to see their one minute heart rate recovery following exercise. Also a, a very valuable marker, again, directly related with all cause mortality and cardiovascular risk. How quickly does their heart rate drop uh, following an intense amount of exercise? That's what we use it for. Um, also, we know just generally speaking how aerobically fit somebody is by looking at that so it can help us make training decisions uh, from there. Do they need to do more low or slow work, go for walks, things like that, if they only have like a 15 beat heart rate recovery in a minute. And I, I mean, I have seen that. And so right. that's more- Do you mind sharing real quick rate. with everybody what those, mm -hmm. like what those standards are, kind of like yeah. what you're looking for? So for yep. example, like a resting heart rate under under 50 is like really, really good. 60 is good like or average. And then ab I like to see under 60 and then above 60, like you're saying, that's when we would make that, like, let's do more steady state. And then also share with everybody what type of uh, heart rate recovery, recovery you're looking for, like the number and then how long you're going to mm -hmm. test that for just because yeah. you, you and touched gonna, on it, but you didn't if, give numbers. So, yeah. Yeah. And just, and if people are listening to this, I'm going to put, in the show notes, notes uh, the studies on the IFT test, the studies on heart rate recovery, the studies on resting heart rate, because I have them all uh, queued up here. So, um, yeah, you'd like to see a resting heart rate when people wake up under 60. And, but one thing is important to note is that resting heart rate means in this sense, like they just got out of bed. It's not like middle of the day, lay down on the ground. Now, if someone's pretty fit, they could probably get their heart rate pretty low at that time. But if they're stressed, there's more variables to worry about, right? If they're stressed, if they just had coffee, uh, whatever it might be, if they had to walk in there quickly, their heart rate's going to be slightly elevated. So, I mean, in terms of, hey, put your heart rate monitor on when you get up in the morning and before you had coffee, and let's just record your heart rate for the next, like, week or month. Right, and take Generally, it lying down. Be a so good idea. Keep, mm -hmm. this, keep the test, take it at the same time, in the same place, in the same position to get data over mm -hmm. A long period of time. I think that's where a lot of people go wrong with resting heart rate, or they say like, "Oh my God, my resting heart rate is 70. And I'm like, "Well, you took it at noon uh, after you've been working yeah. all day. You had two cups of coffee and you were standing up. Like, yeah, I'd expect it to be above 60. Uh, but mm -hmm. like you're saying, it in the morning, right after you wake up, uh, before you've done anything, lying down is when you would want to take that number. So that's where we're getting that 60 number from. Um, Rest, resting heart rates during the day should be higher. And it's important, I think, to take a larger data uh, set than just like one day, because like, right. I'll tell you today, because I worked a bunch, I was out late last night. If I woke up this morning, my resting heart rate was probably not very good. I bet I was like, <laughs> probably around 60. Whereas like normally, I'm probably around 42 um, when I wake up. And so uh, you want to make sure like you look for uh, red herrings and things that, that pop up that are away from the mean the, because you can usually find out there's a reason for that because your resting heart rate is not just a marker of your cardiovascular health, but also your uh, 
sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system, right? And so that's why um, it's a marker. And when they look at the research, they took a bunch of data on people's resting heart rates and they followed them for long periods of time. Um, and it was this was a um, a uh, review of a whole bunch of studies in what they found is people who were consistently like above 60 or uh, even like towards 70 all the time um, had much significantly higher risk of um, cardiovascular related death or cardiovascular events when compared to people who have low and resting heart rates. So I always tell people like, let's push it towards 60 or lower. And so when I see people who consistently have a higher resting, they also tend to have a poor heart rate recovery. Um, when we talk about that idea of the aerobic window, right? training for aerobic power, which is what we're going to talk about in a moment. We talk about max aerobic speed. And then the other end is the bottom end of the aerobic window, pushing the resting heart rate down. The amount of total work they can do aerobically is bigger if the resting heart rate's lower and their max aerobic speed's higher, right? And so what they find, those same people with the high resting heart rate tend to have a low drop-off following intense spot of exercise. Their heart rate does not drop quickly. And so what they looked at in the study looking at heart rate recovery is what they defined as abnormal heart heart rate recovery and so even as low as like 12 beats in the 60 seconds following exercise which is really low that's pretty bad um but i mean walk, go walk around the streets in your local city and look at some of the people who don't exercise and like they we know the majority of people don't exercise we know obesity is higher than ever uh, people are more sedentary than ever it's not a surprise to me also um that there's a lot of people who probably don't have great heart rate recovery. And so what I would like to see is like a minimum of 30 uh, okay. in the minute fall. In how many seconds? Um, in, in, a, in a minute, I'd like to see 30. Uh, 30 in one minute. At, at minimum. Yeah, I'm just yeah, putting this ideally, on the like, show we're notes seeing, for everyone. Yeah. We're seeing people uh, like our athletes that are like our 40s in their 40s and, and up to 50 in a minute if they're really fit. Um, and again, this number will also be influenced very strongly by the stress state that they're in like their initial drop especially the first like 15 seconds is very indicative of their parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system the initial drop in the first like 10 to 15 seconds the second half like the 20 seconds on is going to be much more indicative of their actual aerobic health um because that's when the blood's getting pumped right the initial drop like not many much blood is moved right it's really just a nervous system like calming everything down. But I mean, those two things are obviously intimately tied together. And so right. when it comes to heart rate monitoring, those are the things that I really care about. Or the other thing that we've used is like really seeing really big changes in someone's heart rate during the workout. Um, and like, we've caught a couple clients who were like, Hey, I think you need to go to see a cardiologist. And lo and behold, like they had a heart rate condition, <laughs> they had a, a heart condition and they didn't really notice like their heart rate would plummet really quick or get tachycardia really quick. Um, and so it's more for health screening and recovery screening, not really for intensity programming at all. Yeah. I, I like the, uh, there's an analogy that I've used a couple times and I want to say, I learned this from somebody and I can't remember who it was. It might've been a Charlie Weingroff article because Charlie has that really had that great article a lot. I mean, it must be almost 10 years old now about training the on and the off. Um, one of my which favorites. Is, about the aerobic window we i'll put it in the show notes for everyone <clears throat> uh, i think of conditioning as the as your gas tank so mm -hmm. there's the size of the gas tank okay so how much gas do you have right do you have a 10 do you have a 10 gallon gas tank or a 100 gallon gas tank okay then there's the efficiency so how many miles per gallon you can get so if I can get 10 miles per gallon and I have a 10 gallon gas tank, I can get a hundred miles. If I have a hundred gallon gas tank, but I only get one mile per gallon, we, we have the same aerobic window essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so like there's times when we need to train. I mean, essentially you want to be able to have both, but at some point uh, we always talk about buckets, like is getting your gas tank from being 50 gallons to 100 gallons worth the amount of work that it takes because you're not running marathons, you're a baseball pitcher, right? So mm -hmm. um, it, it might even be beneficial to drop the size of your gas tank because you don't need that much. Um, yep. 
and you need just a big enough gas tank and just efficient enough and efficiency we might be able to call heart rate recovery. Uh, you just need a certain amount to be healthy um, and more is not always better as we know, but also mm -hmm. like there's always a, there's always an opportunity cost or a trade off when I train those certain things. So like, do I give up power to get more conditioning? In most sports, I'm not going to want to do that, but yeah. maybe maybe we have to. So uh, I just like the analogy. It's helpful for me to think of like, okay, we're trying to build a bigger gas tank or we're trying to get more miles per gallon from an efficiency standpoint out of the same gas tank. That's, yeah, perfect. A good, it's a good analogy right there, um, especially from a guy that drives a Tesla. So like, I mean, you don't even, you don't even have to worry. <laughs> we don't even, I don't even have a gas tank. I just have batteries. I know, you just <laughs> plug it right in. Um, and so it's a good segue to talk about max aerobic speed and why we train that and how we test yeah. it and how we train it. Because um, what I wanted to clarify to the, the gentleman who asked the question was actually what we do um, and why we find it valuable and from a logistical standpoint, why it's valuable. So we do what you call a max aerobic speed test. Um, this has been popularized by Dan Baker. So he's a rugby researcher, strength and conditioning coach out of Australia. Um, and he did a, looked into a lot of the research that was originally done by Tabata, right? Like remember the Tabata stuff became really popular and got obviously got bastardized, right? Everything was Tabata, Tabata lifting, Tabata eating, Tabata everything, 2010, 1020. Um, but there's a lot of really valuable data that came out of the Tabata research in terms of improving aerobic power. And aerobic power, to what you just said, is probably the most valuable thing when it comes to sports. Because if you and I were clones, you and I were the same individual, like you're a, literally a clone of me. But I have better aerobic power than you. Of course, I have the, I'm better, right? Uh, of course, yeah, I was just going to say, of course, you have more than me and I'm the, uh, I'm the bum, yeah. but continue. And we're, we're playing, yeah, we're playing soccer together, right? And over the course of the match, I am able to work at a higher intensity aerobically than you. Eventually, you're not going to be able to keep up, right? You might be more powerful, like you might be stronger, but if I have more aerobic power and I can work at a higher intensity relative uh, to you... I'm going to be able to do that more repeatedly, right? Because we know once we start to tap into higher amounts of um, anaerobic uh, energy system production, there's a higher cost of doing business there. And so it's mm -hmm. harder to repay that debt. There's more fatigue byproducts. Um, and then if you think about that over the course of a season, that's cumulative. Also, they tend to fatigue more over the course of a season. So getting people more aerobically powerful. So we talked about that aerobic window, pushing that anaerobic threshold, if you will, a little bit higher because you're going to be working more aerobically becomes very valuable. And so we want to pursue improving aerobic power um, because, again, the efficiency of the gas tank and the size of the gas tank grows if you do that. And so what Dan Baker looked at in all that research was um, what were the intensities that they were training at and how those relate to improvements of max aerobic speed in VO2. And what they found was training at 100, above 100% 100 of your max aerobic speed had the largest improvements in improving your max aerobic speed. So training at like 110 to 130 um, percent was the, the main window that they were doing it in um, for intervals of like 10 seconds on, 20 seconds off for eight rounds or 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off for eight rounds. And so when they were using those protocols and slowly building volume with them over time, they saw the most meaningful improvements in max aerobic speed. And so that is really the training approach that we have used uh, with our athletes, doing it specifically on an air bike, like an assault bike or an airdyne bike. Um, it's important to note, you could really do it on anything, um, but the mode has to be consistent with the test. And biking uh, has a lo low injury risk. It's easy to teach. People don't screw it up. Uh, and it's easy to set the intensity because I can look at the bike and look at the watts and look at the time and manage it very easily with a large group of athletes. And so that's really what we do. And we can get our running conditioning through other things like running shuttles or running tempo runs. <laughs> wow, we can pursue the aerobic power adaptations um, while riding the bike. So I have a question for you because I know this is gonna come up yeah. um, and mm -hmm. I understand it 
myself, but I'm not going to verbalize it as well as you will. Um, I will defer to Kevin on anything research related or conditioning related because you are much more well versed than I am. So when I have a conditioning question, uh, I just ask, I just ask Kevin, <laughs> so I don't need to go research and look for all of that. Uh, so we, you're using the bike for many reasons, but is, do you lose anything, uh, regarding the research or the data versus by doing, using the bike instead of running because running you have change of direction, you have ground contact, and your heart rate's going to mm -hmm. always be higher when you run. Um, so you're going to reach mm -hmm. different levels of heart rate intensity um, just due to the amount of work it takes to fight gravity when you're running mm -hmm. uh, versus riding the bike. So do you lose anything by not being able to run to find max aerobic speed or... Does it not matter because you're just finding data to make better decisions moving forward? Uh, both. Uh, okay. So because in, in in the the mass aerobic speed number is specific mm -hmm. to the mode that you do it in, right? And so you okay. can't do a test on the bike and then take that data and go run, right? You have to do the test running and then train running. Um, right. So, so you're saying then, if you do it on the bike, you shouldn't use that. Yes, that no, number can't. to go then yeah. test their run. Okay, got it. Yeah, so it's, whatever the mode is, understand. It has to be congruent. And I'm so to clarify that. And and to that point, the reason he said, "Why don't you do the IFT?" is because it's running related and change of direction related. And I get that. Yes. If we only trained on the bike and didn't run the athletes, and they weren't running, then it right. probably wouldn't be a great decision, right? But our athletes are running tempos, and they're doing. Uh, uh, 75 yard shuttles and 150 yard shuttles and uh, 300 yard shuttles progressively over the course of the summer, right? So they're getting change of direction work and they're getting that higher intensity running on a different day. So if we're training four days a week, we're probably biking two days, running two other days. And so we're getting those same qualities. We're just not pursuing the max aerobic speed uh, approach through there. We're training, we're training like more a lactic when we're doing things like 75 yard shuttles and more anaerobic when we're doing things like 150s or um, 300s, right? And so um, we're getting those qualities elsewhere. And so then let's talk about how we actually test. Um, yeah. What, what we do is a max aerobic speed time trial, um, or you could do a time trial or you could do a distance trial. All it has to do is be is long enough, like they say, like four to six minutes um, so that you're getting it, making sure it's an aerobic test, right? By definition, if I'm working out, if I'm doing a bike ride as hard as I can for five minutes, it has to be aerobic primarily, right? You go back to your original X phys class and they're like, oh, anything under 15 seconds is uh, a lactic. Anything 15 to, you know, 45 is uh, lactic. And then anything over a minute is aerobic, right? We know it's not that cut and dry, but the substrate, mm -hmm and energy metabolism is going to be primarily aerobic when you're doing something continuously for five minutes. And so by definition, they're going to ride the bike. We're going to do a two mile, uh, assault bike, which depending on how fast you ride could be like four minutes if you're really fast, or it could be like six something if you're slow. Right. So you're going to fall within that window. And so that's what we chose as a distance. It's easy. Um, we, we've all consistently wrote it, so we understand it. And we're going to tell the athlete, I want you to try to complete this as fast as you can. I don't want them to come out as fast as they can and then crash. So I'll say, Hey, why don't you start around for the first like 30 seconds? Look at the individual. It, if they look like an average high school male, I'll be like, start around like 65 RPM. So six to around there. And let's just see how you feel and then build it. Right. I'd rather they go there and be a little bit slower then come okay. out the gates hard and then crash because then the data is no, really no good. And so um, we're going to say, go as fast as you can. We get their time. That's the one. That's one thing. So we know how long it took them to do. Um, we get the readout on the bike. will give us their average RPM. That's going to be our max aerobic speed uh, measure. You could also use watts. Whatever your power output is, you could choose watts or RPMs. doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent in using it. Um, and then we can measure their heart rate recovery. So how quickly does their heart rate drop in the minute after? So we have all that data. Um, and so then that RPM number is going to be their max aerobic speed. By definition, their average 
work rate over the course of that test that they worked as hard as they could aerobically would be their max aerobic speed, right? So that makes sense that I pretty cut and dry. They'll take that number and then we will prescribe those 10, 20, like Tabata style intervals, 20 tens, whichever we're doing at the time at either 120% or 110% of that number. So 110% of 65, I can't do that math in my head, but I have a chart that looks like a multiplication chart that we already did the math on. And I can tell them, okay, when you do the sprints, I want you at 74 RPMs. And that gives them a starting point, right? And from the data that, I mean, people like Dan Baker are smarter than me, um, that we took, that, those are the numbers that they found correlated with changes in VO2 and max aerobic speed uh, most strongly. And so then we're going to have them do those intervals. And the benefit of that for us, as opposed to doing that field test we mentioned earlier, is it only takes me four to six minutes. Um, and then the conditioning protocols still also only take me four to six minutes because they're doing like maybe three sets of t 10 on 20 off or 20 on 10 off, um, three sets of eight, that's like four to eight minutes, right? And so it allows us to fit it inside a commercial friendly model. These people have other things they need to do. Um, and it allows us to control it because I have a bike with all the data right in front of me. Uh, where I can very easily get a readout. So from a practicality standpoint, it's very easy and very short, um, but seems to be very effective because then we retest that max aerobic speed test at the end, 12 to 16 weeks later, and these kids unanimously like blow the numbers out of the water. Their time gets faster, their max aerobic speed goes up, and subjectively they tell me, like, I feel like I'm in much better shape. So that was going to be my next question is, so the cadence for – retesting would be you said 12 to 16 weeks you retest it do you ever so here's the here's the problem with testing someone say for the first time or they've only ridden the bike a few times they don't know right mm -hmm. what to ride at because they don't they don't have any context uh do you ever have mm -hmm. people do like one or two or three of them in a week to maybe average a number or take the third one because they know what or do you give them like a relative mm -hmm. range of rpms to stay within and then it is it you said it's every 12 to 16 weeks would there be a reason to do every eight weeks just curious yeah. and so that's a really good question and so this is why it's important if you're going to prescribe conditioning to your clients mm -hmm. that you actually do it yourself um yes. because if you just say, ride as hard as you can, or, oh, no, go at, like, 90 RPMs, like, the kid is going to die on the bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's just not going to yeah. make it through the test. And so, it, like, for me, if I see, like, an average high school male who is reasonably in shape, I'll say, hey, this first test, why don't you try to go at, like, 65 RPMs and just see. And I'll stay there with them. Don't just leave them on the bike. That's another thing I say to our coaches. You can't just leave them. You have to sit there and look at them. And if it looks like they're slogging, like, okay, you, you probably shot too high. Um, but then you're going to find out their data based off that. But if it looks like that's really easy, I'll be like, does that feel pretty good? Yeah, okay, crank it up then. Because then their average is going to come up. And then it's a starting point. So say, let's just say over the course of the test, their average RPM was 70. Okay? You have them do those uh, 2010 intervals at 120%. And they're like, that was pretty easy. And you can look at them and be like, that doesn't look like it's that hard. Then you can go higher, right? Because when they were actually doing Tabatas, they were at like 180% of the people's uh, uh, max, uh, max aerobic speed. And so there's room for that, right? So you can continue to push it a little bit higher, but if, at least the data gives you a starting point. Because the problem is a lot of times when people prescribe intervals, they just say, go as hard as you can, right? Yeah. And that's probably no, not I mean, effective because so you don't know what it's fits some yeah. What led to us using and learning from Dan Baker and many others and finding this test is because that's what we used to do is we would just say exactly. 20 <laughs> seconds on 20 seconds off, ride as hard as you can for eight reps, 10 reps. Like we didn't have, we didn't give people numbers. We just said, ride as hard as you can or ride faster or ride at a easy pace. Right. So like we didn't have, uh, like you said, we weren't prescribing conditioning as well as we could. So like we never like, or not never, but you don't go in and you say, Hey, just bench press until you can't move anymore. Right? Like, what, what does that mean? Like how many sets, how many reps, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the, what's the end goal? Right? Like, 
just hey, just squat until your legs hurt. I don't know. Just just do a lot of reps. Like, but that's what we were doing on the bike. Like, yeah, yeah. just get on the bike and ride until you can't ride anymore. Uh, so this is what led to us prescribing better conditioning numbers and and finding this max aerobic speed. Um, question yes. for you. So selfishly, I'm learning mm-hmm. a lot here because. Again, I I'm familiar with all this, but I'm not probably well versed in the nuances like you are. Um, do you coach them during the test? Are you giving them mm-hmm. feedback? Are you cheering them on? Are you, or are you just do you just shut up and let them go? Oh yeah. And so there's a few things. One, make sure the bike is set up correctly. Um, another thing I hate, I'll come in and there'll be a kid on the bike like this, like their <laughs> hands are up above their head, their knees yeah. are up to their chest. And I'll look at the it's intern and I'll be like, did you think that this was okay? He looks like a clown <laughs> in a circus. Right. <laughs> and so the, like the bike typically at the top of their pedal, their foot, their knee should be just almost extended. They should have a tiny bit of flexion left. Right. That's mm-hmm. the right height. The seat. So uh, soft seat, knees. Soft knees and yes, the, when just, their legs are just barely. Yeah. Then the seat forwards backwards, like the if the handle shouldn't be in the rib cage, and then also when the arms all the way out, they should be able to hold on to the handle, right? So you got to yep. get take the time to set them up because that's going to have a significant difference on how they okay. ride. Um, and then yes, I'll say okay, I'm going to say hey, start at 65 RPMs in the first like 45 seconds to a minute. If it feels like that's really easy crank it up a few RPMs and push it a little more. Um, if it, and if it's too hard, they're just going to go down anyways. Right. And so then as they go, motivate them. Like I, I'll put, if it's the first time that all the kids are doing the test together, so there's good energy. I'll be like, all right, everybody get on the bike. And as they're getting into that, like it starts to go into a dark place at like two and a half, three minutes. Right. Cause you're like starting to feel, the acidity come up. You're starting to feel the fatigue and the heavier breathing. So, like, be there. Be like, all right, let's go. You know, mo- come on, keep the arms going. Keep the legs going. Don't let them take the arms off, right? Don't let them stand up. Some things the kids, they get uncomfortable. They, like, try to stand up and pedal. I'm like, sit your ass back down on the seat um, because, it, ultimately, you're going to be more powerful like that. And so just getting them to understand how to, like, again, we take for granted, that, like, that we ride the bike. They, the younger kids especially, like a 13-year-old kid, might not really know what they're doing, even the adults. Um, and so giving them feedback and then motivating them is important. And especially that last, like, I can see the distance ticking away one mile, 1.5 miles. I know that Mm -hmm. 0.3, just close your eyes, got it out. Right. Just finish it. Right. And that's when you, that's when you can say, go as hard as you can. It's going to take you 30 seconds, 40 seconds. So just put your head down and finish it. Right. And then I say, sit down on the bike, Look at your heart rate, and then we're going to look at it again in a minute. Let's see what, what happens. And then I just okay. record whatever their, at, their average power was right there. We write their times up. We have a big chalkboard in the bike room. We put their name. We put their bike time up there on their sheet. We write their max aerobic speed. So then I have the numbers for their intervals. Right? It's very – if you do the protocol, it's very simple if you have everything set up correctly um, to do it. Got so it. You, so do, you do have to coach them for sure. All right. It's set up your bike correctly. Soft bend in the knee, arms straight. Then it's yes. give them an RPM watt slash window to start from and then adjust it up or down based off of what you're seeing as the coach over the five to six minutes. Uh, keep them sitting down. Feedback and motivation are okay. Get a 60-second heart rate recovery at the end. And for anybody who wants to see this, we have a Movement as Medicine YouTube video that you did uh, called the modified Cooper's you can test, watch me which get I will, tortured. you can watch Kevin, uh, die on the bike and we will, I will put that in the show notes right now. Yeah. And was and that like all this, correct? Know, we do this with the, yeah, you nailed it. We do okay. this with the kids and we do it with the adults. Um, the adults, this conditioning isn't as strictly programmed mainly because they're coming for 12 months continuously. So Dan will do a phase where we do do a lot of Tabatas type style style stuff. Then he'll do ones where we do like distance type intervals. But you can also prescribe a starting point based on the max aerobic speed based on those intervals. And so when Marco Sanchez was working for us, he put together this nice chart that looks like a multiplication chart or a prilipin chart. 
um, where on the top row it has a bunch of max aerobic speeds ranging from like 50 to 80, I think. Mm -hmm. And then on the side column is all the different dist distances or types of intervals based on the percentages that we got from the Dan Baker stuff for the 2010s and whatnot. And I believe and that's so all we available on just... strengthcoach.com, right? That, that, is, spre that spreadsheet yeah, you're talking PDF. about? Okay. Yep. And I'll you literally just go well. like this, like a multiplication table, and just go. And then you figure out their starting point. It's very easy. And so just reference, well, you can reference that. And again, maybe you do it and you're like, oh, this was too easy. Okay, then go, you can go harder. Um, but at least we know, like you said, you don't just say go pedal as hard as you can. Because you have two things. You'd have people who come up too hard and can't complete the conditioning that's prescribed. Or you have people who say they're going as hard as they can, but they have no reference point as to what they should be doing based on their test. So they might just not mm -hmm. want to work that hard that day. And so if you give them a number, then they actually say, oh, man, I'm, I'm slacking by, you know, five RPMs today. They, they get some feedback. And so that has been very effective for us. Um, and again, logistical considerations, it makes it very easy. We have like 20 assault bikes in the conditioning room. So I could, we could throw all the kids on there and just do it. Um, and most people can ride a bike even if they're a little bit injured, right? They might not tolerate running well. Um, so maybe we're not doing much running, but they can probably ride the bike. Adults who have injury considerations in history can ride the bike. Uh, and there's not a lot of instruction and variability in how to do it like you might have during running, um, especially for gen pop clients. So, all right. So in, in summary, yeah. all right, I'm going to just go through yes. our, our little, every, we're working on a Google doc together here, which is where we track all the show notes while we're doing these podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. so there we do, we discuss how we use heart rate monitors at MBSC, right? So it's mostly for resting heart rate and heart rate recovery, resting heart rate. We're looking for something that's under. 60 beats per minute after waking up and lying down uh, before you start your day. Uh, heart rate recovery, we are looking for a 30 beat drop after a 60, uh, 60 seconds after a high intensity bout of exercise. Um, and then health concerns. So we use the heart rate monitor, as you mentioned, that we've had moments where like we've literally caught people having heart attacks using the heart rate monitor yeah. uh, system because we have we've been able to watch and track people's heart rates that we know have been in our groups for a long time and notice, hey, your heart rate's way different today than it's usually like, is something going on? Are you feeling different? Like. Why is your heart rate so high? And you're just, you literally just got here. Um, so we've caught some things as well. Uh, there's the 3015 IFT test, which uh, you described in the beginning, but we don't necessarily use it due to logistical constraints. Uh, I do have a question for you. If somebody wants to do the running test, you have that test, but also Dan Baker's resources, I believe, have a lot of the running max aerobic speed tests in, in there, right? Correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, like, he has normative okay. values, and I'll put a link to that to that okay. research as well. And so uh, he has all normative values for different levels of sport in different sports, like what you see in professional soccer, what you see in collegiate soccer, what you see in okay. rugby, like what the typical standards are. Which So if you're depending on who you're training, you can have a reference point. To know like is this good or is it not good uh right. so right. um and again that's going to be very that's going to be directly related to again the mode that they do in it are they running and the sport like you don't like you said certain sports don't require a high max aerobic speed if they went to a shot put competition and got the max aerobic <laughs> speed i'm sure that thing would be pretty low but they might be world-class yeah. athletes right or, so or it's actually the, to yeah, the, the need the person who threw the shortest might most likely have the best max aerobic speed because uh, it's it's a power sport. Uh, you don't need it uh, exactly. as much. Yeah. Um, and then the final part of this summary is what do we do for a max aerobic speed test for at MBSC or Certified Functional Strength Coach? Uh, it is the max aerobic speed test on an assault bike. It's two mile time trial. It lasts between, most people will fall between four and seven minutes, five or six minutes. Um, make sure the setup is correct, get the heart rate recovery, and then we use that number, uh, their max aerobic speed number, to then give better 
uh, or prescribe better conditioning sets in regards to 10 on, 10 off, 20 on, 20 off, 15 on, 45 off, one minute on, one minute off, um, as opposed to just say, hey, hop on the bike and ride as hard as you can. <laughs> Yeah, and so, again, we'll put all those resources in there. They're very helpful um, to kind of look and compare and contrast, and you can understand where the different approaches might be more valuable or less valuable depending on your constraints or your populations, and then be able to make better decisions based on what you're doing. And that's really why we're having a good discussion in the first place, right? Yeah. All right. So, um, anything do you have a book? More do you have a book add? recommendation? I do have a book. I do have a book, and it goes along – with everything we talked about today, it's called How Bad Do You Want It by Matt Fitzgerald. It, it's one of my favorite listens on Audible of all time. So How Bad Do You Want It by Matt Fitzgerald. And I'm going to use an example here, and we kind of talked about this a little bit. So imagine you have a client or you have a group of 12 people. Okay, You have a group of 12 athletes, and you come in. And you put them all on the bike and you say, I just want you to ride however you want. I'm, I don't know how long you're going to ride. I don't know how far you're going to go. Everybody just ride. I'll, I'll decide when you're done, right? Everybody's going to be like, uh, like, okay. So like, how hard do I ride? Like, all right. So like no context whatsoever. Okay. So now I come in, I say, okay, everybody is racing each other. And whoever gets to three miles first wins an iPad. All right. So now we have some motivation and everybody's going to go for it. Okay. Uh, also, I'm going to announce and there's going to be a leaderboard. So you're going to get to see who's in front and who's in back. So he, in this book, he shares all the research of, uh, how people run when they're leading from the front and how people run when they're chasing somebody, right? So when you are the chaser, all of a sudden you find this different gear, but when you're the chasee, you might not have the same gear. Um, so there's the whole psychological part of this as well. Also, if I come in and I say, okay, ride as hard as you can for the next 10 minutes, and I've never ridden the bike before and you've ridden it for the last 10 years, you know how fast you should ride at 10. Like, okay, I, I'm going to ride for 10 minutes. You know, I don't, I have no context. So I'm most likely going to gas out. Okay. So, uh, what you say when you come in and what you prescribe matters. So it's not just prescribe. It's also what you say and the constraints and the environment that you set up. So, if there's no constraints, no environment, no information, no feedback, that's pretty confusing. Like, I don't know what I should yeah. do if I don't, right? I could be on this thing for the next six hours. I, I don't know. You you just told me to get on it. <laughs> or if I'm racing somebody, now I've got this extra gear I can find. But if I tell you to ride as fast as you can in one minute, that's a lot different than riding as fast, as far as you can in 20 minutes, right? So you're going to use different gears um, based off of the information, the constraints, the so the book is, I believe it's eight or nine hours of the uh, studies, the and then like it gives you he gives you a lot of information on like what you should say to an athlete when they are racing um, to make sure mm -hmm. that you are going to get find that extra gear because every athlete is different. So like. Again, do you enjoy being the chasee or do you enjoy being the chaser? So like sometimes it's actually beneficial for you to be in second or third because it's going to make you run harder than what you would run at first. And so that means mm -hmm. you need to know your athlete. You need to know what to say. Um, and it was a fascinating book and it makes me, I'm going to go listen to it again after this discussion because um, like we talked about, it's way more than just like, hey, go run a 300-yard shuttle as fast as you can. Um, yeah, and it goes we, back we, to... We can do much better than that. Yeah, it goes back to why we time sprints, right? The reason yeah. we had to start timing sprints. It's unbelievable with the kids that when we said run as hard as you can for 10 yards, how poor of an effort we would probably get from a, a chunk of them. Meaning like they ran maybe 80%. The second 
there we recorded their times they ran harder and then when we put up the big clock on the wall that displayed their time for everybody in the gym to see they mm -hmm. really ran hard and they kept asking to run more sprints All, uh, nothing changed in what we coached besides that and so if you're not getting some sort of objective feedback same thing with shuttles we'll say hey i need this one under 30 seconds i need them under 30. then when they run a 28 i need them under 28 right mm -hmm. and so continually giving them feedback as to what the expectation is um because again if not if i'm like hey run it hard like you said that means nothing um without data nothing. to support it yeah nice. so that that book was how bad do you want it by matt fitzgerald love that um this is interesting i can't i'm not i don't know if this book is good because oh i i listen i flew over here i didn't bring a hard copy book with me because i had so much crap I had to bring so many t-shirts. I had to bring all this podcast setup. So I was like, I'm just going to listen to audiobooks. <laughs> but uh, I like literally couldn't have fit a book in my bag. But I've got, I've unloaded a lot of t-shirts to uh, this week so far. And so I'm right next to the mall of the Emirates. That's the, the mall that has the ski area in it. Um, so it's like I go there for everything. Yeah. And I was you like, I'm going to buy a book buy and a ski book. down. <laughs> ski down yeah, exactly. while you're reading it. I was like, I'm just going to go to a Borders. Let me just tell you. Like this Borders bookstore, maybe they maybe had like 50 books. Like they had not a lot. It's like bookstores don't really exist anymore. The fact that Borders is even still open is a miracle. Um, <laughs> it was mostly like a toy store with a few books in it. And so I had no plan. I just said, I'm just going to go and see what looks good. I'll find something. Um, and it wasn't a lot of good selections. But this one uh, is highly recommended. It's called Business Adventures by Ooh. John Brooks. And so okay. it's like 12 stories business stories um, of different successful companies and lessons that you get from them. And so if I read the back, like Ford Motor Company, um, Xerox, General Electric, all these different companies, like it's, I, it seems to be very similar to how I made this, like the podcast mm -hmm. about the different businesses mm -hmm. and then the lessons that you can extract. And so I, I was like, I would really like, I have like the next couple of days off when I get to the Netherlands to actually just have a book. I like, like to read a hard copy book to be able to just yeah. sit and read. Cause when I'm at home, I almost never have that. Um, so I just picked it up. So I will let you know over the next right. couple podcasts, uh, what my take is on this, but it says it was a bestseller. I don't know if that means anything. It says actually, <laughs> um, on the back, it says, um, Bill Gates, this is the best business book I've ever read. Um, oh, that's so, high I mean, praise. Yeah. I mean, Billy, I mean, Billy reads, Billy reads a lot of books. That's what he said. So I don't know if he was paid to say that uh, or not. Um, <laughs> he donated and, to the foundation to get. And that I know quote. fifty percent of people think that Bill Gates created the coronavirus, but I'm going to take <laughs> so, his yeah. word for it because he has that, more yeah, money that... and more successful than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never take business advice from somebody who makes less money than you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give it a go, but it looks pretty interesting. So. Um, I'll let okay. you know how it is, but, um, what's had, the author's name business adventures John, by it's by John Brooks, John Brooks, 12 okay. classic tales from the world of wall street. So, all right. Yep. Yep. So Very I'll let good. you know how it is. So, um, that brings uh, us to right about an hour. Yeah. 58 minutes. The, uh, the only thing I got coming up is anyone who wants to is in the LA area. Uh, I'm teaching in LA on May 22nd at heart and hustle. And, and nice. it's not, is it, I don't know if it's downtown LA. Um, well, it's LA is a pretty big place actually. Uh, but yeah, LA at heart and hustle on May 22nd. If anybody's interested, that's the next place that I'll be, uh, you're in the Netherlands. And then after that, are you, are you off for a little while? Hanging with it up baby, for a little baby while. Stuff? Yeah. Hanging it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have to. Um, yeah. So this will be my last <laughs> CFSC to. for a little while. This okay. will be my last CFSC for a little while. Um, but I'll keep doing After podcasts that, with the baby. Yeah, we got uh, um, we got Perform Better so, coming up uh, this summer. Yeah, we and we have a lot of CFSC in... events, just mind you. We have a ton of events coming up. Yeah, um, not just you and I calendar. only teach. Yeah. We have lots yeah, of other so. great teachers. Just not It's not only you and I. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, we do have perform better. Neither of us are doing Orlando, are you right? No, because because Orlando okay. is like right when Ariel is due. So I'm yeah, okay. only doing Providence because um, got it. And I'm doing Chicago. I, mm -hmm. So 
make All it right. local. Well, so, thank you. Another hour in. Uh, we'll speak in a couple days here. We got uh, guests coming on next, and then we got two more episodes after that. We've already written the scripts or the topics at least. So, yeah, um, very good. Appreciate you, and thanks for listening, everybody, and enjoy your Easter. Well, I guess you won't be listening to this on Easter because it comes out on Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, yeah, signing do? off from Dubai. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Brendan. And uh, see you at the next episode.